Hey, everyone. My name is Joel Priest. I'm with Rackspace Public Cloud. I've been an engineer with Rackspace now for going on about four years, public cloud the whole time. And my name is Ben Burdick, uh, also an engineer with the Rackspace Cloud. I've uh, been there since 2008, wow. working with, uh, uh, originally with Slicehost, the first gen cloud servers, and now OpenStack. Cool. So we're going to be talking to you today a little bit about how Rackspace handles fleet management in our OpenStack cloud. So a little bit of background information about uh, Rackspace here. If you've been to any Rackspace talks, you probably know these facts better than me. We're a managed cloud hosting company based out of uh, San Antonio, Texas, founded in 1998, uh, home of fanatical support. We have more than 200,000 customers across 120 countries. Our fleet, it's been in OpenStack Cloud, has been in production since about August of 2012. Uh, we are in six regions, originally launched in Dallas and Chicago in the States and London, and we've since spread into Virginia, Hong Kong, and Sydney. Uh, each of our regions are essentially a separate installation of OpenStack. They all have their own separate API endpoints, and um, are, the control planes for them are all completely separate. Uh, this encompasses tens of thousands of hypervisors, hundreds of thousands of instances, 340,000 plus cores, over 1.2 petabytes of RAM. Um, those were conservative estimates from several months ago, so those numbers are inaccurate. And <laughs> all, of our num all of our hypervisors are running Zen Server. Oh, and uh, we, as far as OpenStack services, we run Nova, Glance, Neutron, Ironic, Swift, Sender, um, and more. Uh, always looking to add more. And uh, Ben and I's primary focus is based around Nova and Glance for the most part, and Neutron as well. Sorry. So why are we here? Uh, spoiler slash a little bit of a teaser. We want to start giving back more to the community. Um, at our scale, we've been running into issues regularly with scaling OpenStack, and we've done a lot of work to account for that and make OpenStack scale to tens of thousands of hypervisors across six regions, yada, yada, yada. Um, and we want to start bringing those tools back into the community so that the same people don't have to start fighting the same battles we did a couple years ago. So uh, we really want to start open sourcing some of the tools we're using on the fleet ops side. We wanted to have a lot of that ready to go by this summit. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, so the kind of teaser is that hopefully if you get to make it to the Austin Summit, we'll have some stuff for you guys there. That's the plan. It just takes a little while to get all of our in-house stuff kind of cleaned up and ready for public consumption, but that's what we're working on right now, or one of the things we're working on right now. So kind of the rest of the story. Why are we here? We looked at the things we struggled with, and like I said, we go to these summits, we see other implementers, other operators, running into the same challenges we did. So obviously, there's a need there for these kinds of tools to help y'all and us as well grow our clouds. And as we started looking at our cloud when we were first starting, like what could we do different if we had 50,000 instances? What could we do different if we had 100,000 instances? And the thing that we kind of realize is that the ultimate goal is it shouldn't matter how many instances there are. It should be just as easy for us to operate a cloud with a million instances as it is with one instance if you're doing it right. You should be able to, that's the ultimate goal. Obviously, it doesn't scale that way in reality, but that's what we're trying to reach for. A set of tools, a set of implementations that more or less teaches the cloud to run itself, and then we can just be there to kind of babysit it and make sure those things are doing what they're supposed to do. So how do we do that? The elusive OpenStack configuration management database. Uh, if you've been to any of the recent summits, especially the operators, mid-cycles, that kind of thing, this has been a very big topic recently in mailing lists at the mid-cycle. And there's been some blueprints, blueprints floating around between us and some other large implementers about how do we do this? How do we get a CMDB into OpenStack, one that makes sense, one that does what we want it to do? So the main thing that we've run into is translating things outside of OpenStack relationally into things that are in OpenStack. Not all of our data that is relevant to our cloud and how we run it is within an OpenStack service. It just doesn't work that way. We have asset tracking met software. We have networking software that doesn't have a real construct inside of OpenStack. How do we put all of those things together into one place so that we can access that information and then build tools around that? My ultimate goal 
with the CMDB as an operator is I shouldn't have to think about where to go to get information about this part of the hypervisor or like this part or where does this live. I should just be able to say, tell me about this hypervisor, get a big object that says where it is, what's on it, what's it doing, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do that? In our view, that came down to a collection of tools, not one tool. We don't want this giant monolithic piece of software that's just as difficult for us to run as OpenStack is in the first place, because that it doesn't help us at all. That actually makes our job twice as hard. So we want a very, I hate to use this word, agile, small set of tools that are focused and easy to use and directed and can each do what they do well and hopefully without too much complication so that they just make their job, they do their job of making our lives easier without too much hassle. So what, on the operator side, what does that mean? The things that I want from my CMDB, correlation, consistency, sleep, and vacation are the, the last two, way more important than the first two, by the way, but it's how do you get there. So correlation, how can I tell what's affected within my OpenStack cluster if something outside of the OpenStack implementation has a problem, for instance? If a switch goes down, I should be able to hit some kind of database, make an API call and say, this switch is down, what instances are affected, what hypervisors are behind it, if it's, say, our internal cloud, because we run OpenStack on OpenStack, what, which of our services actually live back there? Or is our, or do we have four API nodes down because this switch died or anything like that? So I need to be able to correlate data from outside of OpenStack that OpenStack doesn't recognize to OpenStack things. Consistency. I want to query the infrastructure and say, hey, give me every configuration for every hypervisor. Give me this value from every hypervisor. If I get 999,000 answers back that are one value and three that are another, that's probably bad. So we need to be able to make everything consistent as much as possible. Sleep. If we can make everything consistent and correlated and there's thus build tools around enforcing that correlation and enforcing that consistency, I can actually go to sleep at night, which would be great. And if you want to learn more about how I can't sleep, I have another talk tomorrow at about 9 a.m. where you can learn all about how I didn't get to sleep for about a week or so. And then ultimately vacation. I should be able to go to OpenStack Conference for a week, come back, and have my cloud not be a smoldering pile of rubble. It should be able to run itself with very minimal intervention on our side. So this is what we started asking ourselves when we thought, how do we build these tools, and what tools do we need? Can the fleet provision its own capacity? That's a big one. I want to be able to plug a set, a new, a set of new hardware and say, this is earmarked for this region and this type of hardware and the system detect that and go. Bare metal provisioning, installs in server, configure it with this IP, yada, 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 plug it in, run tests on it. Can I build to it? Does it work? Great. Go, go have fun, customers. Congratulations. Here's some new hardware. What will it take to get the cloud to heal itself? If I can plug in new capacity and have it build itself from the ground up, I should be able to take a problem hypervisor, run any fixes on it if it's got bad RAM, live make right off of it, send a ticket into our DC operations, which, by the way, DC operations on Sung Hero, a large implementation cloud. Replace that, run tests on it, make sure it's good, run any updates on it, put it back in. Just the same thing as adding new capacity almost. What can we learn from web apps? This is one thing we started thinking about was hypervisors, the fact that they're physical doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, again, DC ops are the ones who are doing all that. As far as I know, our physical hypervisors don't actually exist. I've never touched one. I've never seen one except in pictures. It's just a compute power to me. It's just as real to me as VPS is for our customers. So once you start thinking about it that way, it's just another resource in your cloud. It's another way of doing computations. It's another place you direct things. It's just it's no, it, like, again, it's no different than any other worker node for a virtual environment. So that means hypervisors are expendable. Pets, not, or, sorry, cattle, not pets. Like, <laughs> we want to be able to get rid of a hypervisor. Obviously, not if customer data is on it, <laughs> ideally. We want to save those. But as far as an operator, if I have a hypervisor that has too many problems and it either can't be salvaged or we've moved everyone off of it and it's not worth it, I don't, I don't want to be... I don't want to have that thing around forever. I don't have to worry about it. I want it to be replaced or fixed or just gone if it needs to be. So then we start treating everything like a node. We, again, we run OpenStack on OpenStack. So 
physical hypervisor is no different than whatever VM I have that happens to be running Glance or happen to be running Neutron. It's just another service as far as I'm concerned. And how do we scale this? If our cloud got 10 times bigger today, again, should be just as easy to do that as it was for me today. Also, again, in practice, that's not going to happen. But that's the end goal, and that's what we're striving for. And so the ultimate end game, when we know we have done all this as best as we can, is we get to the point where our cloud is ordering its own gear. I want to be in a position where, say, our Chicago cloud gets low on capacity for, let's say, our Performance One hypervisor, detects that, sends a ticket off to our supply chain, says, hey, I need another cell of performance gear. Gear shows up, gets rolled in, gets plugged in. Switch says, oh, hey, all my ports just lit up. All that server starts going through all your provisioning stuff. Hands off. Maybe you know, somebody check if a bunch of uh, purchase orders come in for a few million dollars worth of gear. But you know, more or less, it just kind of happens, and we don't worry about it. So assumptions in terms of our solution for this. One, we're running cells. We were basically the first people to run cells. That's not normal. It's becoming more normal. And just out of curiosity, who here, is anybody here running cells in their implementation? Sweet. <laughs> well, there's been a lot of talks recently about bringing cells more into the fold, making it more of the norm. That was a big topic of discussion, I believe, in Paris or Atlanta, I can't remember which one, about even going so far as to make cells the default. You, you start with a one cell deployment out of the box. Um, Zen server, anybody here running Zen server other than us? Yeah, I didn't think, didn't think so on that either. But so a lot of our specific things we have now, obviously we can't, if, even if we open sources today, we can't give you our run book on bootstrapping your hypervisor. If you're not running Zen server, that doesn't help you very much. And we run computes as VMs. And we do it in essentially a one-to-one -one ratio. Every hypervisor we bootstrap, we put a small, VM on it, that's our compute node, and it's only in charge of that hypervisor, except for our Ironic. They, um, obviously, you can't put a VM on a bare metal machine someone else is using. Um, but other than that, one-to-one. -one. It increases the complexity quite a bit. I mean, obviously, you just doubled the amount of nodes you have to control, because now you have a one compute for every hypervisor. But it gives us a degree of flexibility that outweighs the complexity. And control planes. It's all on VMs. Like I said, we run OpenStack on OpenStack. We call it iNova. It's a small OpenStack implementation, one for each region. And that's where all almost, mm, I think we only have one service that isn't completely virtualized at this point. Everything else, VMs. So how do you manage that complexity? First example for that is going to be hardware. We have five separate flavor, flavor classes within those we are sourced from at least one up to three vendor, hardware vendors. And from those vendors, we might have multiple revisions of the same piece of hardware. So worst case scenario, you're looking at that, five flavors, three vendors. You're looking at at least 15 permutations just on your hardware types. And that's just at the hypervisor level. Things might change upstream in our networking implementation. So we have to know what our top of racks look like. We have to know what our aggers look like and all the way up the chain. So. That complicates things. That complicates everything. Testing, pushing a small code change should work on everything, right? Well, you know, have to double check on at least 15 different flavor and hardware implementations to make sure that that is actually true, because that's not something you want to make an assumption with. So even very small things get extremely complicated when you have to do it 50,000 times, 100,000 times, 200,000 times. Edge cases, death by a thousand cuts when you're trying to push things at the scale that we are. So very high level view of how we started to attack this problem. First layer, human interaction. It's going to be a fleet management interface and trending and reporting. Need some place you can go and look and say, how is my cloud behaving? You know, is, what's my API availability? What's my latency for, you know, how long does it take me to download an image? How long does it take me to do this? You need to be able to look, and look at that so we can make intelligent decisions as the human operators of this cloud. And a fleet management interface, to that, it, to that we mean sometimes you do have to trigger something manually. So I don't want to have to go in and manually type out an Ansible command to run a playbook for cell. I can do it. I do it all the time. But I don't want to have to do it. I want it to, at the very worst case, be a button I can press. And it'll go run itself. So 
That is going to be built upon automation services. Automation services, playbooks, we're big fans of Ansible. Any Rackspace Cloud, private or public talk you go to, we're going to be talking about Ansible to some degree probably. So we have a set of playbooks to address all of these things that we're doing across all these hypervisors. And we need those to be doing provisioning, auditing, and remediation. New capacity needs to come out. We need to audit it to make sure that it's as you expect it to be. And we need to be able to fix it when it's not. And then inventory. We need to be able to pull all of the, that data from all those multiple different places, aggregate it, one-stop shop for everything you need to know about your cloud, and we need an API to interact with it. So now we get to an inventory management system. The goal with that, single place, all that data lives. I want to make one API call, know everything I need to know about a hypervisor. And that's going to be pulling information from asset management, Nova data, you know, and wiki pages. There's probably stuff that no one else knows at Rackspace except for two or three people, which is bad, right? So you want to be able to put that into some place that you can access because, you know, things happen. So we want to put all that in one place. So what do we do? We built something called Galaxy. Now again, we talk about Ansible a lot. We're not talking about the Ansible Galaxy. So we unfortunately picked a, individually picked a same naming convention with that. And what this is is a database of all the information we have from multiple sources. We can do human entry to put data in there manually about something if we have to, or it can be pulling from our internal systems that predate the Rackspace cloud by five, six, seven, ten years that we need to be able to still be in line with. Pull information out of core, sources of information from core or any place else, and give me an API so I can pull and push from it. At its core, it's a very simple concept. It ends up being a key value store. The challenge is building one that works well with OpenStack and building all of the collectors to pull up all of that different information and put it in that key value store in a uniform way. So this is a very high level view of, of Galaxy. Primarily it's an API, but we do have um, a graphical front end for it that gives a very simplified view. It doesn't have all the data, basically greatest hits where you can kind of take a look at it, see how many hypervisors, see how many cells, is the cell enabled, maybe it's, maybe it's in the middle of being provisioned and it's, and it's not enabled yet. Um, and you can drill down a little bit more. This is a look specifically at a hypervisor. Again, not all of the information is here. Um, the API is there for us who are doing the heavy lifting and really need all that data. And then this is more of a high level view for either us to, again, cursory view or for like, less technical people who need to take a look. You know, account manager needs to take a look at it and see, oh, what, you know, what's going on with this hypervisor? What's it look like? That kind of thing. And all of those tools, all of the data put in Galaxy enables us to build all of the other tools for provisioning and remediation. It gives us the platform to put on, to build on top of. I mean, you're, you're doing fine. I'll keep going. <laughs> I'm here all week. So uh, yeah, um, we're, we're going to talk about the provisioning process. Uh, along with all that, all the automation, the tools we've built, we've built a tool called Terraform which again, we, I know there's another tool called Terraform. We're, we're very unlucky with picking our names apparently. Um, but Terraform uses the metadata that's set in Galaxy, uh, which the host will boot, when you reboot a host, it'll boot via DHCP, uh, connect with Galaxy, read the appropriate metadata saying, you know, things like, does this host need to be re-imaged right now? Does this host need to be re-kicked? Does this host have customers on it? Um, you know, and it's identified by, via LLDP. And if it does need to be re-imaged, Galaxy stores the data about which image we want to put on the machine, you know, whether it be Zen Server 6.0, 6.2, whether it be, you know, some other future hypervisor, hypervisor version we may decide to use. So ideally, you know, we want hands-free provisioning at all times. Um, we do, you know, at any given time, we do have hundreds or more hosts at some stage of the provisioning process, and it's just too much for anybody to keep up with manually. Um, you know, so this, this really helps speed up that process. We used to rely on other teams that would kind of set up the base OS for us, and then from there, we would provision the software we need, the compute information, all that kind of stuff, but you know, then we have to rely on another team who has their own work priorities and, you know, it's sometimes things just don't get online as quick as we might need them when we're relying on a, a different group. 
Um, you know, and we know that our future is multi-hypervisor uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, you know, basically we, we also want to focus troubleshooting on hosts that are known good. So if a host is acting up, we have the ability to easily migrate or live migrate instances to a new host machine and reboot the host and have it re-kick from scratch. Uh, if it's still got problems from there, uh, you know, then we know it's a host problem and not a hardware problem and not a software problem. You know, and there's always, you know, some set of hosts that are going to have software problems for a variety of reasons. And, you know, it's easier to just go re-image it than sit there and try and diagnose what the actual problem is. And, you know, hopefully someday we can reboot a host and it will just upgrade itself magically. And we built a lot of automation services uh, on top of Galaxy and, you know, in addition to Terraform. Once the host is Terraformed and has a new image on it, uh, you know, as he said, we do use a lot of Ansible. Uh, we have some what we call our bootstrapping playbooks, which basically you run a playbook and it gathers all the information it needs from Galaxy, uh, networking information, hypervisor information, uh, code version information, basically everything you could possibly need for the, for the hypervisor to know. And it, about 30 minutes later, host is online. Uh, we have some system auditing things that check for things that monitoring doesn't. Um, you know, for example, if you're setting up an HA pair, as you said, we run, we run the cloud on top of the cloud. If you're setting it up, up an HA pair, what are the chances that those two instances land on the same hypervisor? Maybe slim, but it happens, and we want something out there looking for things like that. that can say, hey, you have an HA pair that if this host goes down, they're both going down. That doesn't help. Um, another one of our great automation services is what we call Resolver. And, you know, that does a lot of a lot of automated alert resolving. Alerts come in, you know, a lot of uh, basic things like, uh, you know, it's easily pluggable. We have basic things like disk usage. Uh, is the Glance API up? What's the load average like? And a lot of these are easy to fix. You know, you don't need a human to do that. If the disk is full, you know, you, we've identified areas where the disk is filling up, files that can be removed. Um, and it's just a waste of time for a human to go in there and delete log files that are no longer needed or, you know, clean up a mess somebody made in root. <laughs> and so, you know, an alert comes in, a resolver grabs the alert, goes and does it for us. Uh, you know, you can also plug things into resolver, you know, manually if, if you need to. And, you know, 60, 80 percent of all alerts can handled, be handled by a service instead of a person. You know, it makes a lot more sense to have the person, the people, deal with the, hum the alerts that can't solve themselves, which are most of them. Um, in between Auditor and Resolver, uh, you know, we kind of have a self-healing cloud going. You know, Auditor will go out, make sure, you know, everything's where it should be, the universe is happy, if it's not, it will tell Resolver, hey, we got a problem over here. Resolver will reach out and try and fix the problem. If Resolver cannot fix it, then it gets escalated to a human. Uh, but if Resolver can handle it, a human never sees it, never has to deal with it, everyone's happy. Um, we still need people to interface with the fleet, and, you know, a big part of this, not everyone who needs to interface with it is, you know, going to be wanting looking up everything via the command line, so we do have built some really nice interfaces for these tools. Um, and this can, you know, gives you a lot of sorting abilities, gives you a lot of, you know, at a glance overview of what's going on with the fleet. You know, you can drill down to open issues, issues that are being currently worked, uh, you can drill, drill down from, you know, the top of the region to all the individual cells to an individual hypervisor all the way down to an in individual instance. Um, here is also where we are 
holding our live migration orchestration. Um, you know, live migration is, is something we've been trying to get better at. And, you know, from here, we can have the assistance of ops folks who, who may or may not have access to the hypervisors to easily help resolve customer issues by going in here and scheduling a live migration, keep, keeping a check on its status, seeing if there's any failures, what that failure might be, um, and escalating it if need be. So this is an example of a cell. Uh, from here, you can take an aggregate instance view or an aggregate host view. Uh, so at Rackspace, we have data in a lot of different places. Uh, and that's one of the things that Galaxy helps with. And this is getting its information straight from Galaxy, is it takes data from all those various sources and it puts it in one place, as well as gives us an ability to have a place to store the metadata that we find important that the other tools within Rackspace don't find important. And this is the view that many of the operators want. Um, this is an instance level view as well, but this is, this is the host view. And you know, from a top down, you can at a glance see kind of the health of the host. Uh, when, when it last alerted, what the alert was for, uh, was it resolved? When's it going to check next? Uh, it's going to tell you the cell it's in, the region it's in, what Nagios node monitors this host, as well as a variety of other information. Are alerts even enabled? Also, you can see on the right there, the host tasks, that's where you could manually trigger an action if you wanted to. Let's say, for instance, a human needed to look at this, decided this host was unreliable and needed to be migrated off of. That section on the right, where it says host tasks is where the admin could go in and say, lab migrate, don't trust this thing, disable it in the host DB and move on. And it would move all of the instances off of there for us, ideally. Ideally. It's not doing it right now? No, it is doing it right now. It just means that sometimes, if it's a suspect host, there's maybe something that would prevent oh, it from working. It. Come on, Rega. <laughs> I sat up here to heckle. It was a legitimate question. <laughs> So yeah, and uh, along with visual visualization, uh, you know, we capture all the aggregate data and the trends. We have all kinds of pretty graphs. You can, you know, go look at pie charts, go look at bar graphs. Um, you know, we use a combination of Abacus, Elk, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, uh, as well as our own homegrown tool called O3 Fleet Reports, which kind of gives, you know, a single dashboard where people can view all these various services in one place. Um, you know, for example, Elk will send OpenStack. We send OpenStack logs to Elk. If you see 500s from the API, you can easily filter, you know, by region, by cell, by tenant, and kind of identify exactly where those API, those 500s are coming from in the stack. Um, and from Elk, you can see the entire fleet of hypervisors drill down which cells hosts are running specific Zen server versions, have spe specific hardware profiles, uh, and it's also very helpful, Abacus has been very helpful for viewing capacity reports. You know, it's, uh, capacity has been, capacity is a challenge, especially when you're running cells. Um, you know, because eventually you may have a cell where you actually have no more physical room to grow in the cell. And it's important that you know if that happens. And that's actually one of the things Resolver will do. If Resolver sees that a cell is getting too full, Resolver is going to go and weight that cell down so that customers can no longer build there. And we want to leave a good gap there. You know, we want to leave empty hosts there because if we do need a live migrate host, if we do have an issue where we got to migrate instances off and we don't have a host to migrate them to, then we're in a pickle. So yeah, our, uh, our next big goal is kind of a self-aware cloud, you know? provisioning from nothing. We want the DCE to be able to hook a cab up, turn it on, it automatically gets booted via DHCP to Terraform, which installs the OS on it, which will then tell Resolver, hey, we've got a new OS, clean OS, bootstrap me. And from there, it'll run the bootstrapping playbook, set up all the Nova, the Nova compute nodes, set up networking, get everything going. 
and Resolver will call some post automation, post provisioning automation, which kind of does some basic tests on the host. Um, basic, you know, QE smoke test kind of thing. Make sure that the host is actually functional. You can build instances there, instances ping when they're done. Um, once monitoring is green, the smoke is green, host automatically gets enabled. So cabs rolled in, turned on, a couple hours later, it's automatically in production. No one had to do any work. That day, we did all the work, <laughs> you know, a couple months ago. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, and you know, the point of all this is, we, you know, uh, as some of you may have been at uh, Darren's talk yesterday, there's the, uh, the OSIC clusters, uh, Rackspace private cloud and beyond. You know, they're spinning up two large 100 node clusters for community use to kind of... What? Thousand node. You said 100. Oh, yeah, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we want to use this as kind of a testing ground to integrate a lot of these tools we built um, because it's, we'll be setting up the cloud, but it's not really our cloud. Um, so this will be kind of the first trial dry run of running these tools that is on a cloud that isn't so Rackspace specific. Um, because eventually we would like to release these tools to the community. And, you know, we have a ways to go because there are so many Rackspace specific things in there. Um, so this is going to help us identify kind of what we need to rework, what we need to tweak, what we need to leave out. To, for it to be helpful to everyone else. And, you know, so, we, you know, we're, it's probably not going to be part of the big OpenStack ecosystem, but we do want to give it back. It is very useful. Um, OpenStack or non-OpenStack, um, I think it would be useful for a variety of folks' infrastructure needs. Um, so, yeah, we don't know yet. What we need, what work we need to do to get there, but that is the plan. Um, and so we're engaging with other groups in these discussions, and we're going to figure out what we need to do to get there. And we'll have an updated version of this talk in Austin, and hopefully some progress to report on that front. We'd be a bad host if you came to our backyard in Texas and we didn't have some nice gifts for you guys when you showed up. So that's the idea. Cool. Well. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm. Yeah, anybody? You should. Uh, we, I don't know that we have anything automated in right now that would say we've had, I'm sorry. So the question is basically, yeah, the question is if we've had multiple, say, host down events, do we do tracking to correlate that with a set of firmware, software version, hardware type, et cetera, so that if something wasn't, was put into the environment that was disruptive to that particular configuration, do we have anything to automatically detect that? I don't know that we do have anything right now that's built in that would say we had a spike in host downs and it was this firmware version or this or that. That would be something that we could definitely see if we looked at the trending on our graphs because if we made a change and then we see a spike, we would then start looking at, you know, one of these things is not like the other. What's our, what's our common denominator here? Why did this happen? And we have absolutely done that in the past where we've pushed something out. And you know, we have multiple different versions of Zen Server running. We have in just in the next gen cloud, we have hypervisors from 6.0 to 6.2, and we're already about, we're evaluating 6.5 for new stuff as well. So I mean that's not getting it's getting worse before it gets better until we get some of this stuff more sorted with on the live migrate and upgrade paths and all that. So we have definitely had things happen in the past where we've had a large number of host downs, and we've you know you do Pareto on it, right? Like where what's the 20% of causes for these 80% of host downs? And we've looked and said, oh, it's something in 6.1. What's different in 6.1 from 6.2? Oh, it's this driver. We need an update for this. You know, get our contact. It's in the server on the phone. Get our contact with our you know with our NIC manufacturer on the phone. Whatever we have to do. So I don't know that that's automated yet. No, 
that so part is still maybe on the we, human side. We do have quite a bit automated on that front, though. Um, you know, and that's part of the auditor service that you know kind of validates the host against a certain set of rules. And you know, some of those rules are: uh, Does this version of the hypervisor have all the latest patches? Uh, has it been patched but not rebooted? Uh, or has it been patched and rebooted? Because often those can be very different things depending on kind of the updates you're doing. Um, so we're enforcing what we want it to have, but we don't have anything automatically telling us what we want it to have is wrong, I guess is the way of looking at it. And if it, if it does fail some of those rules, you know, it will talk to Resolver. If Resolver can handle them, it will. Um, you know, things like that. Updating firmware through an automated process live in production can be kind of iffy. So it's, yeah, it's not quite doing something like that yet. Um, we would like to be alerted on that, uh, which is not currently happening, but um, definitely, definitely something we're looking at. Anything else? Right now? You had mentioned 60 to 80 percent could be automated. Is, are you actually there? Or is That's, that yeah, something like 60 to 80 percent of the alerts that are generated in our environment are handled by Resolver at this point. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Whether we alert on way too much is yeah. debatable, though. <laughs> Where is that? Yeah. So Ultimate. What if uh, Resolver is down? What if Resolver is down? Yeah. We have a second Resolver that all it does is watch Resolver. That's not true. So <laughs> uh, you know, ultimately, that would, that would be real bad. So we have, um, I mean, we have, we have Resolver monitored. It's, we have our normal monitoring infrastructure, and those alerts are the normal. Those alerts are still going into us, um, places that we can see outside of Resolver, outside of alerts. Um, and and, res and Resolver is just getting its data from elsewhere. Um, we do have multiple Resolvers running, but if something were to happen, uh, we actually have playbooks to spin up new Resolvers. Uh, so if it is down, it's it's not going to be down for very long. Yeah, and and it will pick you know it'll pick up right where it left yeah. off. If like if, for instance, if if the audit auditing and monitoring tools went down, our admins and engineers would notice that immediately because that's where they live all day at work is looking at that stuff. If Resolver went down, they would also probably notice because their queue of things to look at would be huge because Resolver wouldn't be fixing any of those things automatically, which would, that would probably sort itself out real quick. I, I don't know of any way to uh, get a faster notification than say doubling a, an admin's workload in a few minutes. <laughs> like They'll find someone fast. <laughs> But um, we don't have anything automated, I think, to put up a resolver. That's an interesting idea, though. If we did something, we could do that cross-regionally, potentially, right? Like have a resolver monitoring, resolver, say, in our Chicago implementation that's monitoring DFW and vice versa. And if resolver notices resolver is down, spin up new resolver nodes. And that's the kind of flexibility we have. That would actually be very simple for us. As long if we have already have an Ansible playbook for something and we can make an Agios alert for it, we can have a resolver trigger for it very quickly. It's basically just a wrapper around Ansible playbooks. It can do other things as well, but that's what we, how we ultimately end up using it most of the time. Questions? No. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.